Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Aman Sharma. I'm an internal medicine doctor and co-founder at Thrombo Watch. In the previous episode, you heard my co-founder Louis Thompson telling a story about a patient who had one of the things called stomach clot. And one of our viewers rightly commented on one of our videos that they wanted to know a bit more about stomach clots. So here I am in this presentation, in this video, I'll be talking about stomach clots. What are the causes? What are the symptoms? How you diagnose them? And what are the treatment possibilities for you or your relatives or loved ones who by chance have to have a stomach clot? When someone says stomach clot, it's a very confusing term, isn't it? Someone thinks, oh, there's a clot inside your stomach. But essentially, when we talk about our abdomen, we talk about your tummy, it has many organs in it. Stomach is, of course, one of the main organs, but you also got the intestines, you have the liver, you have the spleen, and women, you have the uterus, the ovaries. So it basically is a complex cavity in very, where you have so many organs. But when we talk about the stomach clot particularly, it's one of the veins which basically supply and take away the denourished blood or the deoxygenated blood away from those organs back into the heart. They might have a clot. So as you can see on the screen, this soft red mushy sort of structure, these small red circular things are your red blood cells. And you can also see the other blood components and they're fi trying to basically form a sort of very thick mesh. And this is all happening inside a blood vessel, the cylindrical, the circular structure that you can see here. This is how a blood clot is formed. And similarly, the blood clots can form in the veins, which, which supply the intestines, the bowels, the colon, as we talk. The two main types of blood clots in the veins that we can see in the tummy are mesentric vein thrombosis and the portal vein thrombosis. So when we talk about the mesentric veins, mesentric veins basically supply all of your bowel, isn't it? So that's why a clot in the clot in these blood vessels can be potentially life-threatening and it can cause tissue damage and it even can be left with a condition where you have to take the intestines out. Let's understand the basics first, okay? So in my term, I would say it's pathophysiology. For you to understand it's what's happening, what's going wrong. So... As you can again see in the top picture, blood cells, platelets, various factors in the body, the blood clot factors, they all are coming and essentially forming a clot. So the clot formation would be formed in the blood vessels, of course. And whereas when we talk about these veins, as we see in our hands, the superficial vessels, which take the blood away, the oxygenated blood is supplied by the artery. And once they're being utilized, the veins carry them back to the heart. Same goes with your intestines as well. So if there is a small clot which forms, it would usually get bigger and bigger, as you can see on the screen, that the clot's initially forming and it's getting bigger and bigger. So what happens? Why does a clot formation be deadly? You may say because now the oxygen also needs to go back. And now on the lumen, the tube is blocked. The blood which is not having enough oxygen cannot travel back to the heart. And this it essentially can cause congestion and this can even cause that part of the intestine to die. As you can see on the right side corner, you know, these sausage-like structures, these are basically your small intestines. There might would have been a clot in one of the veins and these blood vessels could not carry the blood forward, thus causing a big bit of swelling, a bit of discoloration. In normal word, we would call it as ischemia, which is devoid of oxygenated blood. And this basically is a surgical emergency. So what are the risk factors? Why do we have them? So first and foremost, as we're talking in ThromboWatch about the genetic conditions, the inherited conditions, speci specifically if we talk about states in which your blood has extra risk to coagulate and form clots like factor V latent deficiency. You can have protein C, protein S deficiencies, and also antiphospholipid syndromes. The other medical conditions, cancer is one of the most common reasons for people to have coagulable blood state, and they can have these sort of blood clots. Cirrhosis, when people have liver problems, either related to mostly the most common reason is of alcohol intake and excess amounts. This can cause liver problems. People who also have got irritable bowel disease, people who had pancreatitis, most common reason in the UK for pancreatitis is gallstones. In other parts of the world, alcohol is also a very leading cause. 
if we talk about the lifestyle, smoking, again, very much provocative in all sorts of blood vascular problems. And again, contraceptive use can also precipitate clot formation. Pregnancy is also another hypercoagulable state where the, the risk for clot formation is further increased. And if people had previous surgeries, abdominal surgeries, and various sort of people who might have their spleen removed because they had trauma, they had leukemia and other conditions, sickle cell anemia leading to all of this, also have further risk of getting clots in these bluish sort of pipes that you can see on my left. So what can be your symptoms? See, whenever tummy is involved, the first and foremost symptom that most of the people would get is abdominal pain. This pain can be sudden onset, this can be colicky, this can be dull, this can be severe. I would say any pain in the abdomen which is persistent and not going away is always a red flag, guys. So just keep an eye on those. Digestive distress, you might feel, oh, my tummy is getting bloated. You're constantly burping. You're feeling this sickness. You're actually being sick. You're vomiting. And if this is persisting for a few days, get it checked. Bleeding signs. So if, for instance, someone has a sort of darkish black color stool, we call it as melina. So if you're having sticky, dark, smelly poop, this is a red flag. This can have many conditions responsible for it. But if you see such black stools in any of your relatives, that's always a red flag. Of course, if you take iron preparations, it can also cause black stool, but it shouldn't be sticky. It shouldn't be very, very foul smelling. And if you talk about this condition getting progressed, then you might have fever, your heart rate might race up because then your body is trying to compensate in terms of fighting the infection, fighting this bowel, which is dying, which is essentially making it gangrenous or making it ischemic. This is basically a case where the patient needs to be in the hospital, not at home at all. So when we talk about diagnosis, Fairly simple diagnosis, CT scan is what's needed with the contrast, but you have to be very mindful. These are very specific and tests that not everyone should be offered. Usually the patient needs to be seen first clinically and then the clinician needs to make an assessment because CT scan firstly is a big dose of radiation. Secondly, the contrast that we give during the CT scan can be potentially dangerous for the kidneys if people already have other problems. So we have to make a very pragmatic call on whom should we scan this and whom should not. If they need to be scanned, if we can reduce the contrast or we can do special images and this and that. So that's what a very specialized decision. As per for us, it's the gold standard. But yeah, for you, just wanting to try to explain you what a CT scan is. As you can see on the right, this is the CT scanner. Many of my patients are very worried. Oh, we're not going to get the CT scan. It makes me claustrophobic. I can't breathe. The MRI scanner is like a tunnel. That's very claustrophobic to many. But the CT scan is just like a polo ring. So it's not like you should have that claustrophobic feeling. But many people still have it. If you have it, please discuss with your clinicians beforehand. Many people have been talking so much about the D-dimer test. As I've told, D-dimer can come positive if there is any clot anywhere in the body, if you're having systemic inflammation, very severe infections, all of these can basically reflect in the form of D-dimers being positive. But yes, you would need other blood tests. You would need your full blood counts to see what the infection markers are, how the platelets are doing, how the hemoglobin is doing along with the kidney functions, your liver functions, and even the coagulation profile, which basically gives us an idea if your blood is too thin, too thick, what? Treatment options. If we've diagnosed someone who has a bowel, what to say, vein thrombosis, then basically, if it's an acute condition, surgeons are the one who need to be involved. If there's a bowel infarction, as in the, if the image you remember, the discolored bowel that you could see, or if it's already punctured and perforated, that needs, that warrants surgical exploration and further surgical treatment. In terms of the future of it, once you have gone over the acute phase, people who have severe cases of clots in their veins somewhere in the body, including the bowels, they might need medications to dissolve them but again that's a very clinical decision standard treatment if these patients need medications to prevent further clot formation in terms of whether they need warfarin epixaban rivaroxaban and hence and so forth 
and supportive care. Of course, we also need to take holistic picture into place where you need IV fluids, will you need painkillers, will you would need the rest, and you would also need the treatment of your underlying conditions, which have essentially precipitated all of these problems. But in a general, if we would say, if the clots have been provoked, they have a precipitating reasons, whether it is hormonal therapy, it is in younger women or people who are taking pills for the contraception, that can also be precipitating cause. If you've got a reason, it's provoked. If you don't have a reason, it's unprovoked. And the time span of you being on the medications to thin your blood would depend on them. So what do we do? We do lifestyle modifications. Of course, we always keep saying hydration is the key. That's always going to be helpful to us. Of course, staying physically active makes the blood vessels also work and it can basically help you reduce the overall, what to say, the side effects or overall harmful effects that you might get from these blood clots. Uh, quitting smoking is proven to be very beneficial according with limiting your alcohol consumptions because if you're taking very high amounts of alcohol, it can affect your liver, causing cirrhosis, might cause blood clots, it can cause pancreatitis and hence and so forth. So yes, alcohol in what to say, reduced amounts, limited amounts might be not that dangerous. But yeah, if you're having binge of alcohol, very high amounts every day, most of the days, that's not a definitely good sign. It can definitely affect your life in a very long run. We do try to see if there are manageable conditions, hypertension, diabetes, to basically control them out. But yeah, you should always discuss this with the clinician and make sure if you've got any of the red flags, a and &E and hospital is the place to go, not sitting in your home. So what's my take-home message to you? Anyone can have blood clots, right? If you have the risk factors, it further increases the risk of you having them. That doesn't mean that you will have them. If you have the good preventive strategies, if you're living a healthy lifestyle, balancing things out, hopefully none of us would have it. But again, genetic predisposition and specifically the other risk factors, the provocating risk factors might cause a blood somewhere in a blood clot somewhere in your body. This can be anywhere. As we've talked, you can have DVTs, you can have peas, you can have clots in the belly, which we refer as stomach clots. But yeah, these are very specific people. As you can see on the screen, 37,000 people, one person would get a mesentric vein thrombosis in the UK. What vein thrombosis? The risk is even less. What is most crucial? Awareness. Awareness of the symptoms, awareness of these conditions, awareness of your risk factors. And of course, when if you have these risk factors, if you have these symptoms, the idealistic place is to go to the hospital and make you know yourself presentable to the hospital so that it can be assessed further, you can be assessed further. So that's all from my small talk today about stomach clots. As I said, stomach clots doesn't necessarily mean clot in the stomach, but the peripheral blood vessels, the veins which supply the stomach and the colon can have blood clots deposition in them. And today you've learned what are the symptoms and how you can prevent them. Thank you so much for watching the blood clot briefing. And I'll see you in the next podcast from Tomba Watch. Thank you so much.